uh, go to the back, grab some uh, refreshments from back there. Thanks again for coming. We're glad to have you all. Uh, I'm Dan Rusu from NetSuite. And I'm Kyle from also from NetSuite. Today we're going to talk about uh, how Kotlin actually prevents 50 types of Java defects. Uh, so Kotlin has features that enable you to prevent these defects. And some defects are completely impossible to have. Uh, no matter what you do, uh, you're not able to have these defects. They won't even compile. So show hands, who uses Java? Almost everybody. Who has tried Kotlin? Whoa, half of you, awesome. Cool. So uh, let's get started. And uh, just a quick shout out, thanks to Veronica for uh, managing this. Also thanks to NetSuite for providing the food. And uh, if any of you are looking, we're interested.
those um, or your values only handle in one specific way. So you, you are making some assumptions or accidentally treating a null boolean as false or a null string as empty for a null integer as zero. A really obvious example of that is what the result set does to integer. This is null and that may return to zero. We have this example here. So assume we have some system that's checking for criminals. And we see that we have a, a true equals a suspicious action. That's all good. But maybe something happened and this suspicious, this suspicious action is null. And now we're treating criminals and some broken value as the same. So you get like this criminal. Or not criminal. Last null one I want to talk about. It's kind of tricky, and it's more of like a language thing, an English language thing. People say, "Oh, we don't have null. Uh, we don't have null pointer exceptions," when in fact they do. They're just masquerading as something else. In this example, we have a bank account. We're passing some identifier. We're checking if it's null, and we're throwing an illegal argument exception that really is a null pointer exception. We don't want nulls to be passed through there. In Kotlin. This would be avoided instantly because we would say string not nullable. And you would never be know that no null would never come through there. So null is huge in Colin. And if I can just ask the people at the back if you can just uh, keep it down a little bit. If you guys can hear me. So in Kotlin, um, you define a type as being either null or not or always non-null or sometimes nullable. If it is nullable, then you must always, whenever you use it, you have to check if it's null and handle that case. So at the type system level, the compiler prevents you from compiling code that is uh, using null, possibly nullable values in an unsafe way. Another category of defects is equality defects. This is pretty common. Um, so in this case, get age was a method that used to return a primitive integer. And this check, this was the only way to check uh, primitives if they're equal. Uh, you wouldn't be able to say like, first primitive dot equals. You must use the double equals to check for equality when you're checking primitives. So then uh, we realized that actually if the user didn't input their age, it's missing, so we uh, represent that as null. And we changed the signature of the get age to return an integer wrapper object instead of a primitive. It still compiles, it still runs, but without realizing, actually, we completely broke the logic because now, uh, if you have like brother and sister, they both are age, let's say 12, maybe they're twins, because it's an integer wrapper object, uh, using double equals is actually checking referential equality. So even if it's the same value, they'll point to different objects, and this check will now break, whereas it used to work before. So this is kind of like, you're not even realizing that you're changing the behavior by making like a very, uh, what would seem to be a safe refactoring change. Similarly for all the, all eight primitive types. Another example is, let's say you wanted to uh, clean up the code a little bit. So, uh, if you look at, at the initial and the refactored version, it looks like you didn't do anything wrong. So uh, int employee age is employee.getAge and supervisor age equals supervisor.getAge. So you're like, oh, let's just use them directly rather than storing them in uh, temporary variables. What you don't see by looking at this code, even though this looks like a perfect refactor, like you haven't broken anything, you haven't changed anything, actually getAge is returning an integer wrapper which is automatically unboxed and stored as a primitive. So the fact that you refactored it, now you're checking if two integer wrappers, uh, if they're both pointing at the same object rather than both having the same value. So again, we broke the, the logic. Similarly for all the eight types. Another sneaky one is, let's say you have some logic that is, uh, relying on objects which are coming from a cache. So uh, in this case, uh, integer first equals 100, second is also 100. And then if we say if first equals second, that'll be true. Even though they're integer wrapper objects, 
that's actually using an integer uh, cache. Because, and this is, there's a lot of implicitness here. Actually, uh, since the numbers are less than 128, then uh, it grabs them from the cache rather than creating a new integer wrapper object. So because it's grabbing it from the cache, the check passes because both of them are pointing at the exact same object. Now, uh, you write some unit tests, you do some manual testing, deploy to production, and now you start dealing with larger numbers, and all of a sudden the system breaks. Uh, in this case, dealing with 200 because it's over 128. Now, uh, it's actually separate integer wrapper objects for both. So even though they're the same value, they're not the same object, so that check is false. So again, uh, something that would have worked with small numbers starts to break with larger numbers. And it doesn't have to be numbers. Uh, you could use like a factory pattern that has like a cache. If it's in the cache, then use that, otherwise create a new one. And then depending on the size of your cache or what you're storing, these kind of checks can start to fail. So Kotlin completely avoids all of these types of equality defects because when you do double equals in Kotlin, it's actually tracking true value call. So it's always, uh, it's really compiling down to calling dot equals on it. So in Kotlin, there is no difference between primitives and wrapper types. It's just int or bool, boolean. You don't have like primitive integer versus, uh, like primitive int or versus integer wrapper. So you always use just double equals and it uh, always does the right thing. So um, a little easy one. Uh, and most people, especially starting as a junior developer, it's fairly common starting out. You're checking uh, strings uh, using double equals rather than dot equals on it. So again, call them. That's Here's another quick one, which is just assignment defects. Similar in the last vein of what Dan was just talking about. We can avoid some stuff like this. So we have two examples here. We have a Boolean assignment inside of an if statement, and we have a variable assignment of any type inside of the statements. And these things, if you're not careful, are really easy to miss. So we have our Boolean assignment at the top there. We're saying is employed equals person is married, which actually happened. What is actually happening is we're assigning it married and it is employed inside the new statement. So in Java, this is an expression, which means we can do the assignment and it evaluates. So it compiles, everything looks fine, but we actually change this to disemployed. In Kotlin, we completely avoid that. Inside that state, it's just a statement. There's, it isn't an expression. So the assignment cannot happen. If you wanted to do that assignment, you didn't assign the statement. Cool. The big evil switch. Uh, actually, the column doesn't have a switch statement. They have a when, which is a lot stronger. And uh, basically, depending on how you're using the when, it compiles in the most optimal way possible. So if it compile, if it can compile it as a switch behind the scenes, it will. Otherwise, it compiles into a if else chain. So let's see some. So suppose you have an enum, the priority, and uh, you're going to switch based on the priority and do something. Well, I might have like low, medium, high or something, and then someone else modifies the enum and adds a new priority, uh, like critical or something. So uh, you might forget to handle that. And Java doesn't complain. Java just says, OK, well, if it's one of these ones, do something. Otherwise, okay, don't do anything. Uh, in Kotlin, when we use when as an expression, so in this case, uh, we're trying to turn a priority into a color. So we say priority color equals when the priority is low, green. When it's medium or high, yellow. Otherwise, when it's critical, red. So if we forget an enum value in there, it won't even compile because it's going to say it's not exhausted. So the compiler at compile time ensures that you've handled all the cases. This, so not only, even if you remember everything, someone else can modify it, add a new enum value, and then uh, not be aware of that you're also using that enum, and 
now they've broken the, uh, the code. So another example is missing break. On the left there we have a case when it's low priority color is green, but because we forgot the break, actually uh, it's going to assign it the color that medium uses, which is going to be yellow. So it's never going to use the color green because we forgot that break. In Kotlin, there is no more break statements for, well, there is no switch statement, so there is no break for that. So switch, the, the fall allows you to group multiple, uh, uh, multiple conditions which, which have which you can the same result. Is, is, uh, is there any equivalent that? Yeah, good question. So the uh, question is, in Java for switch, if you skip this, the break statement, then it falls through. So if you have similar cases, that's what you would do. In Kotlin, you can punch them uh, if you comma separate them. Uh, so like medium and high there. All right, I expect to get some potential pushback on this one, but uh, Kotlin doesn't allow turn arrays, not in the strict sense. Uh, what you can do is use if else statements as an expression, and the creator of Kotlin has put his foot down on this, you're not getting turn errors. So, there's a couple quick easy defects that can come up with the turn errors. Can anyone tell me what's going to happen in that example 17 there? So same name and same number of subordinates. 
that seems like it's correct, but it's actually wrong. So if you give two instances of managers, it will correctly tell you if they're equal, true or false in both scenarios. However, if I, if I have an instance of a person, which is not a manager, and then I have an instance of a manager, if, I, if they have the same name, and, then, and if I say person that equals manager, it's, it's going to say, is it an instance of, of a person? Yes, as manager extends person. Do they have the same name? Yes. So then that's going to return true. They are equal. Then when I say manager dot equals person, well, manager is going to, afterwards, it's going to check if it's an instance of a manager, and it's not because it's just a person. So if you reverse the order, it returns false, but that shouldn't affect the results. Like A dot equals B is the same as B dot equals A. So most people, this is a fairly sneaky defect. And uh, even pointing it out, most people would struggle to actually correct it properly to deal with uh, uh, inheritance. So uh, if you don't have to do any of this, then it completely disappears. In fact, data classes are non-extensible, so you can't create another uh, class that derives from data class. Implementing hash code. It's uh, not trivial, so you can have logic mistakes in there. Uh, or you could implement equals and completely forget to implement hash code. So what will happen is, let's say uh, I add a person to a set, and then I want to check to see if the set contains a person. So uh, when I add the person to the set, it's going to use the hash code to uh, calculate which bucket it's going to add it into, if it's a hash set. And then uh, when I get my second person object, which happens to be completely equal, like all the same properties, but because I didn't implement hash code, when I say uh, set contains this person, it's going to take the hash code, calculate which bucket it's supposed to be in to see if it's there or not, but the hash code is different, so it's going to look in a different bucket and it's not going to find it there, and then it's going to say it doesn't contain it, when it really does. Uh, Another one is, okay, we do implement hash code. Let's say we have a class that has like two numbers, A and B, and return A plus B. There's so many numbers that can, uh, so many variations that can uh, evaluate the same value. So you could have poor implementation where the hash codes are very similar. Or you, like, for example, you could say return seven, and it's always identical. So but what will happen is you're working with collections like hash maps or hash sets, and you're thinking, oh, it's amortized constant time. But uh, you're actually uh, kind of degrade and potentially all hash to the same bucket, meaning that uh, all operations like contains and, uh, and uh, re retrieval or removing, all of those are actually going to degrade down to linear time rather than constant time. So uh, hackers could take advantage of these kind of weaknesses to uh, bring the system down. Uh, another one is, uh, so you implement both of them, hash code and uh, equals, but uh, you don't implement them consistently, meaning that uh, two objects that are equal return different hash codes, and then you're going to get that same type of uh, wrong behavior as the other case. So if two objects are equal, they must always return the same hash code. Question. Yes, question. How does Scala know which hash function to use? Oh, how do they know which to use to minimize collisions? So, uh, in IntelliJ, when you create a class, uh, there's a autocomplete option to auto-generate the hash code function. And they took that logic that they use in there, uh, where like they use a prime number, and uh, if you're dealing with strings or whatnot, basically, like, hash code of each one, multiply by a prime number and, and adding all of the different properties. So it's a pretty standard uh, way of defining these hash code methods. Uh, actually, it's even a recommendation to rely on that rather than hand rolling your own hash code. So since these have been around for so long, they, they just use that. Okay, 
there's even more. Uh, you could forget like nullability annotations or uh, forget to guard against null. So for example, your setters or your constructor, uh, you're assuming that you're not working with nulls, but uh, you don't check for that. So now you all of a sudden you're going to introduce a whole bunch of defects, uh, which are going to show up as uh, side effects. So it's going to be harder to get to the root cause. Or let's say uh, you did everything perfectly, you implemented all those methods perfectly, and someone else on a different team, or maybe six months later on the same team, adds another uh, property to this class, and you forget to update all of these. Or even if you do remember, you don't uh, update them correctly. So uh, another one is uh, equals. That's really easy to to write incorrectly, so you might forget to check one of the properties, or you might check referential equality rather than true value equality, or you might have invalid uh, Boolean logic in it. So these again are in the same vein of data class stuff. There's, some, there's a few defects that come from misusing or not using overrides. So we have these two, which are accidental overrides. We have one way where we're overriding the superclass method by adding something to the subclass, and then the opposite, add something to the superclass, not realizing it was already implemented in the subclass. And if it has the same signature, your superclass method's never going to run, and it's going to be hard to determine why that's happening. The exact opposite of that, by breaking your overrides, you can, if you don't have them, you can change the superclass method change the subclass method signature, or you could add the correct spelling of something, like hash code being all over case or something like that. These are minor things, but pretty easy to overlook. Yeah, and Colin prevents that because the override keyword is mandatory. If you're actually overriding a method, it will not compile if you're missing the override keyword. So that way you're always aware of that, and uh, it prevents these kind of problems. Generics. This one is pretty huge, actually, it, almost like a super category because uh, this is really attacking Java at the, at the core. So really, the, the type system itself is much, much more robust, much uh, stronger. Uh, so, for example, Java only added generics starting with Java 5. So all of the code before without generics, all of that you can write so many different types of defects there. And when they added generics, they chose to maintain backwards compatibility. So that, that, which means you can continue to write defective code. You can continue to write these kind of defects. So here's one. Um, if you're dealing with all code or someone that's not uh, too familiar with generics, or uh, I don't know why else you would do something horrible like this, but so you create a a raw type, you create an array list, and uh, we're adding a person to the list, and then somewhere later down, uh, we're treating this list and getting the first element and thinking we're going to get a dog back, but it's actually a person, so we're going to get a class cast exception there. In Kotlin, you can't even define an array list that way. You have to define exactly what is this array list going to store, like a uh, person or dog, or maybe you want to store anything, so you can say uh, array, array list of any. Here's a tricky one. So uh, most people would think if you have a list of strings, this list will only give you strings. But you can uh, use the broken Java type system to end up uh, containing dates in there. So we have our list of strings, which is called names, and then call update list. And now this is an older function that was maybe defined before Java 5 or someone that's not to familiar with generics. And in this case here, we add a new date to this list. It compiles perfectly, runs perfectly, so it doesn't throw any exceptions. And uh, now, at this point, after we've called this method, our list contains a date, even though it's a list of strings. Later on, when we actually attempt to use it, we get the value from there, that's when we're going to get a task cast exception. This is referred to as equals. Uncheck cast. Um, so, 
generics in Java utilize what's called type erasure, meaning that all of the generic type information is only at the compile time. Uh, after it gets compiled, all of that information is erased. With uh, some uh, small exceptions like arrays, it does start at the end of that. So, what happens here is that uh, we created a utility function, convert, uh, using some generic type T. We'll convert the past in object and cast it into a T, uh, a value of type T. So we just return the value casted into a T. Uh, the compiler at this point doesn't have enough information to know whether this is correct or not. And you get a warning like unchecked cast, but it compiles and runs. And uh, we have our list of integers is a new array list, and our nasty value is a date, and then we say numbers add, and then uh, in our utility class, utils.convert into an integer, we pass integer as the, the t parameter, and uh, we get back an integer according to the signature of that function, it should return uh, the same type, and we add up to numbers, that compiles and runs, and now our list of integers will contain a date, and then when we try to get it, again, we're going to get a Class cast exception there. So to be fair, Colin also has the same limitation because it compiles to Java uh, bytecode, the JVM bytecode. However, Colin has a new capability that allows you to eliminate this type of problem. So uh, you can define a function as in line with T being reified, meaning that the type information is not erased, it's kept. And what actually happens is uh, that function would be in line into the call site wherever it's used. And in this case, when we when we use it, we say utils up convert uh, as an integer. The compiler then knows all of the type information. So it's no longer lost, and it knows, oh, I'm casting this into an integer. So at runtime, rather than just treating it as, as an integer and adding it to the numbers list, it actually uh, throws a class cast exception right there. So this way, it catches the defect much sooner rather than having some really difficult to debug code later on because of strange side effects. Yeah, I'm just wondering why the uh, convert method doesn't throw a class cast exception before adding the uh, date to the list of integers. Awesome question. So why doesn't the convert uh, method throw a class cast exception before adding it to the list? The reason is because Java uses uh, type erasure. So the generic type information is only there to help the compiler catch these defects. It doesn't actually do anything whatsoever at the runtime. The only thing it does do is uh, it adds automatic casts. So for example, when we declare a list of integer, that's really just compiled as a list and it's dealing with objects. But then whenever we say like uh, my numbers list dot get, because we know it's a list of integers, at, when it gets compiled, there's a cast added in there to cast it into an integer. So when we work with something where we do know the type, then these casts are added in there. But when we have a utility function, like the convert function, which has a generic type, which can be used by many different places, so we don't. sometimes it will be an integer, sometimes it could be a date, sometimes it could be a string, so this function, when you compile it, there's no type information that you could put in there that would be correct for all scenarios. So what really happens is the convert function gets compiled down to uh, a static function that returns object, so it doesn't return T, and uh, it just says return value. It, there's no casting whatsoever when you look at the compiled bytecode. Here's a, when I saw this, I was pretty disappointed, but then I realized they had, like they were kind of cornered when they designed Java, because uh, they didn't have generics. So you need a way to work with, uh, you need like to write utilities. Uh, releasing a language without having utilities for like sorting arrays and stuff like that, it's not really a complete language. So they needed to have these utilities. And in order to have these utilities, like sort any array of any type, for that to compile, they had to accept the fact that they're going to treat arrays as covariant. And what that means is, 
when we look at our uh, the updated animals function and we see that it takes an array of animal if we have an array of dogs because dog extends animal and because these are treated as covariant then uh, we know that an array of dog is a subtype of an array of animal and that's what it means to be covariant so in this case we create an array of dog woofy and fluffy and then we call update animals and then in this function here uh, we set the value of the first animal to a new cat even though we're storing dogs and that's kind of crappy that it even compiles luckily it's not completely a lost cause it does throw a runtime exception because arrays do store the type but uh, you hope that this kind of stuff wouldn't even compile So lazy initialization, something I'm sure we all like to use in Java, whatever language you want. Uh, it's really, really easy to call it. And because it's so easy, there's a lot of stuff we can avoid. So having to roll out your own lazy implementation is pretty tough. You have to consider concurrency, and a lot of people implement something that's not thread safe. And even if they do get that far, they're not doing the most efficient. Lazy implementation. They don't use double check logging properly. They don't even know what it is. So you see that in a lot of uh, Kotlin. We get by lazy automatically. It's, it's already the most efficient implementation. It's already thread safe, and it's just too few with by lazy. On top of that, we also get the singleton, which is a, like a first class language feature. We can just say an object, and we have singleton right there for us. We don't have to implement anything. This one is huge. This is like a super category. So Kotlin has a completely new capability that Java doesn't have to be able to define domain-specific languages. So it's like your own mini language within the language. When you're using this mini language, you're still writing regular Kotlin code. It's still very familiar, but it's confined and restricted only to allow what you defined as allowable. So for example, uh, you could create a DSL which allows you to generate XML or HTML or SQL or any type of data which has some structure to it. And when you're typically when you're writing like HTML or XML, you're working with a text editor and you don't have autocomplete, you don't have refactoring capabilities. It's very error prone. Uh, for example, in HTML, if I'm creating a table, I might attempt to add table data directly right underneath the table, forgetting to add the table row first. In Kotlin, I can have a DSL that allows me to define HTML. And then if I try to use table data directly inside the table, it wouldn't even compile. That's not even an available function. But as soon as I define a table row, all of a sudden, magically now we have a new function available, table data. So DSLs are a way of preventing huge, whatever category of defect that you want, that you can represent that has some sort of structure. So th this is like potentially infinite number of defects that you can prevent by defining DSLs. So when you're using Kotlin, if you have some structure to what you're working with, you can extract that structure away in such a way that rather than having everyone having to repeat a pattern over and over, and know how to do it correctly, and uh, don't forget about any edge cases or whatnot. You can extract this in one place, and everyone can use it much more effectively and efficiently. They don't have to learn how to do that correctly, and it's actually enforced on compile time, which is really huge. So here's one of those, uh, rather than building uh, data like XML or HTML, in this case, we decided to enforce a pattern. And a lot of people are not even aware that you can use DSLs for this. So a lot of these language features are really powerful, especially as you start to combine them. You can really make a robust system that essentially doesn't allow the developers to do something bad. And you can restrict it as much as you want based on the what you're trying to achieve. So 
uh, in this example, let's say we have two logs, log A and log B. And we have a method that acquires the first log, does something, and then acquires the second log, does something else, and then releases those logs. We have a second method that acquires the same logs, but in the reverse order. So the first one acquires A, then acquires B. The second method acquires B and then A. So let's say a thread comes along, calls the first method, which acquires log A, but before it gets a chance to acquire log B, another thread called the other method which acquired log B first. So now, uh, the first one acquired A and is trying to acquire B, but it's already acquired, so it's waiting, it's locked, it's blocked. And the second thread had already acquired B and is trying to acquire A, but it's, it's blocked because the other thread has a lock on this. So both threads are waiting for each other, and they're never gonna, they're never gonna resume, so you have a deadlock. So uh, we define the DSL where it contains both of the locks, and then we created a method on it using lock A. So when we call that method using lock A, then you can give any code in there to run, and that runs in the context of that lock being acquired. So uh, it, before it runs your code, it acquires the lock, runs your code, and then afterwards it releases the lock for you. So you don't have to remember to uh, put your code in a try finally, and like if there's an exception, you forget, you know, you don't release the lock or whatnot. So it captures that pattern away. But even more importantly, uh, you can't even call the other method using lock B. Because using lock B, if you call that from outside, that's not even available uh, to be used. So inside of the scope of using lock A, now we make a new method available that is only available inside the scope using lock B. So in this case, if you're trying to use these locks, the only way to use it is by first acquiring the first lock, and if you want to, only then you can acquire the second lock after acquiring the first lock. So it forces that pattern and it prevents this type of deadlock. So that's pretty, pretty huge. And, and this is just a specific example, but you can come up with dozens and I guess an infinite number of possibilities of categories of defects that you could prevent by enforcing patterns. So sealed classes, really awesome feature of Kotlin. That's why we have this adjusted seal on here. Um, it's so seal class is not a defect itself. It prevents a ton of defects that are present in Java, though. Effectively, what a sealed class is, it is sealing a hierarchy of classes. So we have this missing types example here, and. By now you're familiar with when expressions. We have this function that evaluates things with a when expression. So we can check if it's a constant, return a number, check if it's a sum, evaluate recursively and add them, or not a number, and return an in. So because these exist in the sealed class, this when expression is guaranteeing that we that we're checking every single class inside that hierarchy. So if we went and added a uh, division class into the sealed class hierarchy, this would go I get an error here. So that's a huge level of safety. Maybe even a little bit bigger, compared to Java, we can lock down the inheritance tree. So in the secure Java guidelines, it's, they say you should make all your classes final. Most people don't. The reason they say that is they don't you're defining a class and you don't want it to be inherited from, you need to make a final. But what happens if you do want to inherit from your class internally, but don't want to inherit anyone externally to inherit from it? Java can't handle that scenario. So there's a big security risk there, lots of bugs can come from that. By locking down this, inherit this inheritance tree using sealed classes, we can inherit from, from everything internally, seal it, nobody externally can, can touch it. And even to touch on that pattern matching a little bit, there's some debate whether exception handling or pattern matching is better. But I think consensus is now driving towards pattern matching being a little more robust and less error prone. So a simple example of this happening, say you want to load a person from a database, and in Java you would potentially throw an exception if something goes wrong, and then you have to handle the exception. With pattern matching, you can load a person, and it's either going to return 
the proper person object or some failed result object. And in our wind experiment, we can easily handle both. We don't have to do jumping. Yes, question. Yeah, with uh, regards to that uh, SIL class hierarchy, they actually have um, uh, their, their keep initiative uh, for the enhancements. They have a results uh, class, and that's uh, is failure or success. So they, they want to integrate that into a language, but they're not sure uh, if they want to do that yet. Cool, thanks. So uh, for those of you that let me hear it, there's a keep initiative, uh, basically a language enhancement proposal for Kotlin to add uh, result uh, success failure type, and that's still, uh, I guess, still being discussed. So a bunch of uh, mis oh yes, question. So, so uh, about C classes, uh, so I mentioned that uh, that uh, it, it allows you to uh, to extend the classes internally, but uh, by preventing it. Uh, from being extended, it's sort of, how does Kotlin do that? Yeah, awesome question. So, how does Kotlin prevent classes from being uh, extended, uh, subclassed externally, and only allowed internally? The way it does that is, when you define a sealed class, that means it's only available to be extended only from the same file. If you try to create another file and define a class that extends from this class, because it's not in the same file, it won't compile. And because of that, then the compiler at compilation time knows these are all of the available classes that I need to consider because they're in that same file. Okay, a bunch of miscellaneous things that are prevented. Oops, I think you. So uh, array index is off by one, or uh, when you're looping, it's much simpler uh, to define loops in Kotlin. You just say like index it in one to ten, and it's inclusive, and it's very clear and obvious. Uh, you could even say like uh, ten down to one if you want like reverse direction and whatnot. But it's so much clearer and so much more obvious that uh, it avoids those kind of silly mistakes. Uh, a lot of uh, index out of bounds issues are uh, eliminated. So. You could say like my list up for each and just work with the elements and you might be thinking, okay, I can do that in Java as well. Java has Java 8 has for each and you specify a lambda what to do with each element. But actually you can't really use that all the time. For one, there's potential like uh, performance concerns if this is like a very hot piece of the code that's used a lot. So uh, with lambda is a great new object. There's a direction there, and extra garbage collection pressure. Um, but even bigger is that uh, in Java, you actually are not able to call any code that throws checked exceptions from lambdas that won't compile. You can wrap it inside of uh, runtime exceptions, but uh, it's pretty crappy. It's also very hard to debug if you get, like, uh, let's say something blows up, uh, looking through the stack traces much harder to read than regular code. Uh, Kotlin for each, uh, you can, the lambda that you specify is actually completely inline. So uh, there's no object creation overhead. There's not even a method call overhead because uh, the details of the for each are actually inline at the call site. So because it's inline at compile time, into the call site, you can call any functions, uh, even if they throw exceptions, even check the exceptions. And uh, just a note that uh, Kotlin allows you to define functions that accept lambdas, and you can define it as being inline, so there's no overhead, but you don't have to make them inline. Uh, and you can still call code that throws check exceptions from that as well. And then uh, if you also wanted the index as well, you could say for each index, and then you would have the element and the index position where it's at. So using these, you no longer need to iterate through collections or arrays by index because you can just use these. There's no, like absolutely zero overhead and the auto bands exceptions disappear. So uh, the Java security coding guidelines uh, 
they have this little snippet in there, design classes and methods for inheritance or declared in the final. So you have to purposely uh, do that. If you leave them as not final, a uh, class or method can be maliciously overridden by an attacker. So even though everyone knows that, we're still all lazy. Or we forget about it, deadlines, we're rushing to get something in. I would say easily 99% of all classes are not declared as final, even, if, uh, even though they're not uh, intended to be derived. Uh, on the other hand, in Kotlin, everything is final by default. If you uh, actually want something to be uh, extensible, you have to mark it as open. So you have to go out of your way to do that, meaning that you thought about that, those scenarios of what will happen people writing code. Additionally, marking a class as open is uh, still quite locked down because all of the methods themselves are uh, also all final by default. So you have to go out of your way and each method that you want to be able to be overridden, you have to declare that as open as well. So you have to really, really make a conscious decision to say yes, this class is going to be extensible and these two methods are, can be overridden. Here's a very common pattern and it's kind of like a super category of patterns because uh, you have the common case where you have to do some initial actions, then you do some something, something custom, and then you have to do some sort of cleanup. So common one is like, for example, like prior of resources, uh, where you make sure you release the, you know, the streams or whatnot. So, or locks, make sure you re release the lock after you acquire it when you no longer need it. And even more than that, make sure you actually uh, handle exceptions as well, because if an exception gets thrown, make sure you actually clean up the final uh, block. So it's very easy to make these kind of mistakes, especially uh, juniors as well, but it doesn't have to be easy problems that uh, are tackled. You can tackle any sort of complex scenario where you have a series of actions to be performed in a certain order. You can uh, actually now extract that into a reusable function and uh, you can enforce this pattern. So rather than requiring developers to mimic a common pattern and reproduce it correctly, just extract it into one uh, place and just have them use that over and over. So in this case, uh, this is actually part of the standard library. Uh, given a lock, you can say with lock and then do some code and then it will automatically uh, acquire the lock some code if there's an exception or not it will also release the lock afterwards uh, kind of a silly one I've made this mistake all the time uh, in my past uh, like missing spaces and strings uh, Kotlin has string templates which make it really obvious to spot that we're missing a space before the name there uh, similarly Kotlin has triple coded strings so that you don't have to deal with escape characters so typically a backslash is an escape character, but in this case, because it's in a triple coded string, then we can very easily see that uh, it's a proper file path there. Nothing, that's why we have nothing empty uh, slide. So uh, Kotlin has a new type which doesn't exist in Java. So Java you have like, when you define a method or function, you can say, this returns like integer or whatnot, or void, that it doesn't return a value, but it still returns. Kotlin has a new nothing type that means this never returns. So when this method is called, you're not going to hear back from it. So you could have like an infinite loop, or maybe let's say you want to uh, wrap a common code where you're like getting a nice user friendly error message and throwing an exception or something. So it, it will never actually return because an exception will be thrown. So when you call this function, and then after this function you try to write some regular code, well that regular code will never be run. So uh, in Java, this kind of logic flaw wouldn't be caught by the compiler. In Kotlin, having code after invoking a function that returns nothing 
is obviously a flaw, and then it points out that you have that code there. Question. What is a good example of a method? Why is that method that it does potentially useful? Cool. Uh, so uh, an example of a method that returns nothing, and uh, more importantly, a useful method that returns nothing. So um, I've I have some business logic. I've detected an error scenario, so I know we've hit a bad case of user input. And now I need to throw an exception, but uh, I need to use a proper translated string. So uh, I could extract that into a method that says, okay, uh, given my like, key, go and get translate the error message and uh, throw an exception with the proper message. So I could extract that like translation and uh, maybe like some user friendly message, which could be like could be like you know a few lines of code just defining some like really uh, easily understandable message. But all of that is strictly for the purpose of throwing an exception. So that's where I would say we learn something if it always throws an exception. I've been uh, I've been hit by this one a few times. So mutating method parameters. So I've been uh, debugging defects, and in my head it looks like it should be correct, but it's not. I, I look at uh, the values that are passed into my method. Yes, those are correct. I jump down to my location where I have the problem, and things are strange because I didn't realize actually the, the parameters have been mutated or higher up in the method. And that's why they're no longer correct. So uh, that should never be done, but it's still done in Java. Uh, I've seen developers mark all of the method parameters as, as final, which is the best practice, but it's way much, too much other. So none of us do it. I don't do it because I'm kind of lazy. So uh, you just hope that people don't mutate them. But it happens. In Kotlin, method parameters can never be mutated. Uh, additionally, we could have a call a method and provide values. If the values are, are of the same type, like providing a couple of booleans or a couple of numbers, it's very difficult to know what those represent. So when we say rectangle 20, 30, is 20 the width or is it the height? It's not clear from that. With uh, name parameters in Kotlin, we can say width equals 20 and height equals 30. So we don't have to worry about like, did we pass the values in the right order? And what do they represent? Also, with name parameters in Kotlin, the order no longer matters. So I could say height equals 30 first, comma, width equals 20. So that's kind of cool. Okay, this one is really cool. It's not available yet, uh, but Kotlin 1.3 is just around the corner. Uh, it's going to add inline classes. Uh, it's not the same as, but kind of uh, along the same lines as uh, Valhalla uh, for Java, so the value types. Uh, basically, inline classes allow you to have zero cost abstractions where you can create a new type. Let's say, for example, I can have a type of kilometers, which stores a double. And of course, I wouldn't make that mutable. Uh, so as I'm working with values of this type, every time I like, let's say I, I take my distance and divide it by two and square root or whatnot, I'm always creating new instances at each computation step, which is very expensive. Uh, Performance-wise, also creating all of these objects on the heap, huge pressure on the garbage collector, especially uh, if the function is not small enough to be analyzed for escape analysis, a lot of this uh, would be uh, stored on the heap, a lot of these objects, and uh, all of the indirection as well. And uh, because you're creating objects, that also means you're jumping all over the place in memory. So because of that, even though we know that uh, it's risky, we have to use primitives when doing uh, math intensive work. So for example, uh, there was a famous NASA example where uh, the code accidentally mixed up uh, imperial and metric units. 
and they treated, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, uh, something like kilometers versus miles. One of them was assuming it's dealing with kilometers and it really got numbers in miles, something like that. So what we can do is, so we get uh, really strong type tracking and robust code without any of the scalability or performance uh, concerns. And you can you could use this for like many different types of defects, but essentially it's a it's a much much stronger type system that you could define. You can even think about like using this for something like uh, subtypes. So for example, suppose I create a type uh, empty list maybe and create another type list of size one. So now I can depending on what I'm doing, I can return values of these types which I can make much stronger inferences about the, the state of the system. And all of this could be uh, completely zero cost. Of. Even though I'm working with these types, it's actually not creating any objects. Questions, yes? So how are inline, I understand how inline methods are implemented in that way, the, the logic is not into the implementation areas. Yeah. How are inline classes implemented? Awesome question. So, uh, <laughs> The question is uh, how are inline classes implemented? So inline methods are just like inlined and copied uh, semantically into the call site, but classes where you can create instances all over the place, how does that work? So the idea is that uh, an inline class, first of all, it has the limitation that it only has one value, in it, one property. So like a double or something. And then uh, whenever you use that, rather than actually creating an object, it just it compiles down to just passing doubles around. So when you're passing like 200 kilometers, it's just passing a double that stores the value 200. But at compile time, because it's defined as kilometers, then it makes sure that it's actually correct. However, if you add, uh, because for example, like uh, collections like list or, or maps or sets and whatnot, uh, because they don't work with primitives, if you try to add one of these to a collection, like uh, 200 kilometers into a list, then it actually does create an object and add it into the list. Because you're working with the existing Java type system under the, under the head. Can you add methods to these uh, classes? Can you add methods? Yes, you can. So one cool thing is, suppose I add an inline class that stores a double, uh, sorry, I mean a long, and I could, trick the system to, I could pretend that it actually stores two values, like a x and y coordinates as integers. And then I could say, get x returns the first 32 bits, and get y returns the last 32 bits. So you can have uh, methods on, on these. Was the question? So the question was, can we make, can we say that actually there's a, a 53rd type of defect that is prevented by Kotlin? Uh, because Kotlin code is so much more concise and expressive, uh, it's so much easier to reason about it, it's so much easier to spot flaws in the code. When you're looking at a long list of instructions in Java, compared to looking at something that does the same thing, but it's a sh much shorter list of concepts being described, it's easier to see if we're doing the wrong thing. So I would say that's kind of like a soft defect. Uh, it makes it easier to spot defects. It makes it uh, less likely to introduce defects. So the rate of new defects should be reduced just based on the fact that the code is simpler and cleaner. So yeah, but it's not a like specific defect. Any other comments, questions? Is Java working to implement some of the advantages of Kotlin? 
Awesome question. And when I, uh, so the question was, is Java working to implement some of the advantages of Kotlin? And when I proposed Kotlin to our uh, architect community at NetSuite, this was one of the things, it's like, well, uh, Java is always improving. Uh, all the releases are better than the ones before. There's new capabilities being added. There's even new safety uh, features being added, which is really awesome. But it has one huge drawback in that, uh, and some people view it as a huge strength. So there's huge investments in the Java ecosystem, and uh, saying that, oh, because we want to prevent this type of defect, we're kind of now 95% uh, of Java code no longer compiles or something like that. That just wouldn't be acceptable. So they made the, the decision to keep backwards compatibility. And they made the decision to say that code that compiled 10 years ago or 20 years ago will continue to compile. And because of that, even though they're trying to improve the language, it's, uh, they must always continue to keep the baggage with them. So all of these types of defects that we discussed here will continue to be able to be added to Java code 10 years from now, as I guess, unless they, for some reason, break backwards compatibility. But that's a really strong goal and focus for the Java architects to maintain backwards compatibility, unless something is like really, really horribly wrong. So they're adding, for example, uh, because the one expression is so much better than uh, the Java switch, they're looking to make a stronger switch statement that's a little bit cleaner, but it, because of the baggage and because they have to uh, limit themselves within the, the structure of the language, if you look at the, what's proposed right now for, for the new switch, it's still, it's like a in-between Colin and Java, it, they couldn't quite get to a clean solution. So, and that's forever going to be true. They're never going to be able to reach the level of guarantees of Colin. For example, they're never going to be able to have null safety because if you have null safety, well, what do you do with all the existing Java code? So, you must continue to allow code that works with nullable values in an unsafe way. How Kotlin is evolving? What new features? Uh, I guess they are evolving the language, yeah? Yeah, so the question is, uh, how is Kotlin evolving? What new features are being worked on? Um, so they started off, so it started in 2010, and uh, 2016 they released the first official version of Kotlin. So it, actually, that's pretty crazy. Six years of uh, R&D, of refinement, of iterating, and trying ideas. And in 2016, they settled on something. If we compare that to other languages, Java was a bit longer. I think it was like three and a half years. Uh, and then other languages are typically like a couple years. So Kotlin has really took their time to, to really uh, refine and perfect the language. So once they got to 1.0, at that point, then they looked at uh, scalability uh, problems. So uh, if you look at a lot of uh, large applications in Java, most of them, by most I mean like over 99%, uh, use threads to scale, which is much better than the old style of like using a separate process for each request. And that was horrible. But the thread is still very expensive because each thread is actually, it has its own call stack, so uh, I would imagine like a thread would take like at least a megabyte. So now if you got a hundred or let's say a thousand requests, you spawn off a thousand threads, you're using a lot of memory, and uh, actually most of these threads are just waiting on I.O., waiting on the database, waiting on the network or whatnot. And uh, dealing with scalability this way, dealing with uh, concurrency this way is not scalable at all. To, to the scale that we see these days. So, uh, Kotlin started working on, the, now it's available, as of 1.3 it's going to be no longer in, uh, uh, as a beta feature, uh, no longer experimental, but they added coroutines, which is kind of similar to coroutines. Uh, basically, it, it's almost, you can almost say that they're like lightweight threads, they're not threads, but uh, something like 
creating 100,000 coroutines, 100,000 things that come in and do actions that's very easily done with coroutines. Creating 100,000 threads, that's, you can't even start to talk about that. So, um, coroutines are really huge. They were working on that. Uh, 1.3, it's going to be no longer experimental. And uh, they were also working on the compile times. So they've made a lot of improvements. So back in, what, two years ago, there was some benchmarks comparing uh, Java compile times compared to Kotlin. And they found that Kotlin was like 15, 20% slower for clean builds and about the same as Java for incremental builds. And they've continued to make improvements on compile times. I don't know exactly where they are now, but uh, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, most of the time, you're just going to do one single clean build, and then you can make a bunch of changes, compile, another change, compile again, so you're going to be using incremental. So at this point, incremental builds are just slightly faster than Java, from what I've seen. So they're going to continue working on the compiler. Uh, they're going to continue working on uh, bug fixes to the language. Every language has bugs, including Java. And uh, the, so the size of the team grew. They, last year, they were 40 people working full time on the language. Now they're 50 people. And in addition to the 50 people, the community has really grown the number of uh, developers contributing because Colin is an open source project. So there's, anyone can use it. Uh, there's no licensing issues. Um, so the community is huge. Lots of people are working on it. And uh, even Google now is starting to help with the language. So uh, at Kotlin Conf, I was just there uh, two weeks ago, I think. And I spoke with the Google team there, and they said that they're also contributing uh, to the language as well. So uh, coming up uh, is inline classes, which is really, really awesome. I'm really excited about that. Uh, another one is contracts. So contracts allow you to define information about uh, the state of the program. So for example, uh, if you define a function like string is null or empty, and you can actually define that. Uh, you can say that this function operates on a nullable string, which might be null. So we can say uh, when this return is true, that means the string is, uh, sorry, when it, re when it returns false, so it is null or empty. That means it's not null and it's not empty. So then we can say the contract for this method is that when it returns false, the string is never null. And because of that, when we use it, so now I can say if it's not null or empty, and then I can start using the string as if it's not null. Because the contract states that that will not be the case. So contracts are coming to the language and uh, they're working on uh, compiler, uh, compiler API that you can plug into it so that when uh, you compile, it can also run some custom code for your, maybe, uh, like, perhaps you want to do extra static checking or something. And they have yeah. a native and multi-platform Oh, yes, multi-platform. That's a huge one. Uh, so, uh, before I touch on it, uh, Colin, you can compile to JV bytecode. You can also compile to JavaScript or WebAssembly. You can compile to native, so to run like an iOS or macOS or Windows. And they have this new concept of a multi-platform library. So typically, when you're writing code, you have uh, front-end validation. If you enter some data, check to make sure it's uh, valid. But you can't trust the front-end because you know malicious users could bypass that. So uh, once you do the front-end validation, then you also do the same validation on the back end to make sure it's, it's, it's really valid. And uh, you need the front-end validation for that instant uh, feedback to the, to the customer. You don't want to have to wait for the round trips all the time. And you can't rely on the front-end validation. So you have to do the same validation twice. And then when you add this validation, then also you're going to have like a bunch of unit tests to test this, that it's validating correctly. So you're going to write all this validation for the front-end and repeat this for the back end, and also write tests for both of these. So you're just kind of duplicating work and, and logic. And, and these, it's never a, like 
uh, one and done kind of scenario. You, you always like add this and then you tweak it and you modify it. So you always have to update these and keep them in sync. So with multi-platform library, you can define this in one place, and you can say this is multi-platform and uh, like performance validation, maybe a bunch of utility functions, and unit test it in one place, and then you can actually have it so that you use this library both from Java on the back end, JVM or like Kotlin on the back end, and also use this uh, from JavaScript for the front end validation. And you can also use multi-platform libraries to be used by, let's say uh, you're making a new uh, mobile app, so you, of course you're going to need Android, you're going to need iPhone, and then you're going to want to have a web client as well, and maybe a desktop client, those are kind of going away. So you're going to have uh, your business logic in so many different places. Now you can have that in one uh, multi-platform library where you define it once, you unit test it in one place, and then you can actually reuse it for Android, iPhone, front end, back end, everything. So that's really huge. And uh, productivity benefits from that are really huge as well. Alright, I know that was really long. So thank you for sitting through that. And we'll hang out a little bit so we can ask more questions if you want. And probably. We're, we're thinking and talking about doing DSLs. We're having all here for doing DSLs next one, so that's a huge one. Definitely come up for that. That's it. Thank you.